Drummer Keith Moon played a crucial role in The Who's early success, but as much as he'd receive acclaim for his distinctive drumming, he'd also gain notoriety for his self-destructive behavior. Nicknamed Moon the Loon, he would die in 1978 at the young age of 32. As a direct result of such behavior, right as the band were celebrating the release of their seminal 8th album, Who Are You? Today we'll explore the life and death of Keith Moon, the Who's best known drummer. Keith Moon was born in 1946 in London, England and raised in Wembley. Moon was thought to have a restless imagination as a child and took a strong liking to British radio comedy, while music resonated with him just the same. Moon would grow up in a post-World War II environment, and like many children at the time, he was oblivious to the anxieties that remained prevalent. On an episode of the docuseries Living Famously, music journalist Tony Fletcher would surmise how Moon, as well as other children, processed the world around them, saying, The kids who grew up don't have their parents' experiences of the war. They don't understand their longing for this peaceful, quiet life. To be quite honest, they're bored. That's the bottom line. You throw Keith into this, and there really can't be any question that he would have qualified these days as being hyperactive. By 1961, rock music expanded its reach worldwide, and Moon, who was a teenager at this point, often performed poorly in school. It was at the age of 14 he dropped out of school and went to Harrow Technical College to become a radio repairman, which allowed him to buy his first drum kit. During one of the Who's first visits to America, Moon would recall his initial experiences playing drums before taking lessons, recalling, It's too far back to remember, but I can talk about when I first got interested wanting to play an instrument. It was the Beach Boys who really started me playing drums. I hadn't really thought about playing an instrument until I heard music that I wanted to play along to. I'd have a kit and just play along with a record in my room, and I'd join a group and do some stuff with them, he'd say. When asked if he'd play other records besides the Beach Boys, Moon would respond, Yeah, I like Dionne Warwick. There were mainly American groups in those days, because Britain wasn't really playing a lot of stuff. There were a few English acts then, but they didn't impress me. I can't remember any. It was like that until the Beatles came along, and then I started to have a serious outlook on playing. Moon's drum tutor would be a man named Carlo Little, who would have a profound influence on Moon's as playing, as he taught him the unrestrained, hard-hitting style he'd become famous for. Little would comment on just how intense their lessons would get, even to the point of going overtime, saying, instead of an hour or an hour and a half, they would be three or four hours. Sometimes we'd have the amplifiers going so loud that we started to see the ceiling crack and bits of plaster falling off the walls. After several years of playing professionally, Moon became competent in his musicianship and by 1964 he'd auditioned for The Who. Prior to his joining, he was drumming for another band, The Beachcombers. Meanwhile, The Who were an up-and-coming R&B cover band consisting of frontman Roger Daltrey, guitarist Pete Townsend, bassist John Entwistle, and an indefinite replacement for previous drummer Doug Sandham, who was normally the peacekeeper in the band. Townsend would discuss in a 1975 interview how Moon auditioned for the band and was taken aback by his appearance saying, Keith Moon rolled up one day, ginger all over, ginger shoes, ginger corduroy trousers, ginger jacket, and his hair dyed ginger, holding a glass of brown ale, this complete ginger vision. He'd come up and say, I can play better than him. He got up on the drummer's drum kit and practically smashed it to pieces. We thought, this is the man for us, he'd say. As mentioned in the 2014 book Rockin' in Time, Moon was quoted with explaining his experience in further detail saying, I got behind this other guy's drums and did one song, Roadrunner. I had several drinks to get my courage up and when I got on stage, I broke the bass drum pedal and two skins and got off. I figured that was it. I was scared to death. Afterwards, I was sitting at the bar and Pete came over. He said, you come here. I said, mild as you please, yes, yes. And Roger, who was the spokesman then, said, what are you doing next Monday? I said, nothing. I was working during the day selling plaster. He said, you'll have to give up work. There's a gig on Monday. If you want to come, we'll pick you up in the van. I said, right, and that was it. The Who's formative period proved difficult as they frequently changed managers. In one particular instance under Peter Medith, they'd auditioned for Fontana Records and briefly changed their name to the high numbers in order to appeal to a mod audience, but their lone single Zoot Suit I'm the Face failed to break the top 50. Eventually with new management and filmmakers Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp, the band significantly improved their live act. It would end up garnering a lot of attention at London's Marquee Club by late 1964, and they were hoping to sign a recording contract with American producer Shel Talmy. Guitarist Pete Townsend had been deeply influenced by the Kink song, You Really Got Me, and to get Talmy's attention, he'd play him one of his original songs, I Can't Explain Over the Phone. Talmy agreed to meet the band during one of the rehearsals, and on the strength of the band's performance of the song, he agreed to sign them to a contract with Decca Records in America and their British subsidiary, Brunswick. Following the signing, the band would subsequently change its name back to The Who before they released I Can't Explain as a single. While the song initially had a slow start upon its release in February of 1965, 
By April of that year, it had made the top 10 on the UK singles charts. After following up with another top 10 UK single, Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere, the band succeeded yet again with what would become one of their most iconic songs, My Generation, which would be their highest charting UK single peaking at number two. The album My Generation would follow by late 1965, with half of it featuring originals, while the later half had R&B covers. But the tensions between the band and Ptolemy would reach a boiling point, and due to an ongoing legal dispute, the album wouldn't be reissued until 2002. While The Who may have been free from Ptolemy's contract, internal tensions were still persistent in the band. Each of the members gelled closely as friends, but their professional relationship was difficult to pinpoint. Those tensions would once again come to a head during a stop in Denmark, which resulted in Daltrey dropping Moon's methamphetamines into a toilet and proceeding to attack him. By this time The Who returned home, Daltrey was briefly fired from the band. He would be let back in though, under the condition that the band's working relationship would have them contributing equally. In what's said to be the earliest known live recording of the song My Generation, The Who's hostility only enhanced the performance. A film of that recording as archived by the YouTube channel Reelin' in the Year 66 substantially highlighted the tension between the band members. As a point of interest, the focus frequently turns to Keith Moon, who throws his hands up in the air mid-beat and launches back into a rhythm, one of his signature characteristics. What made Keith Moon's presence in the band so unique was that he was one of the first drummers to receive as much recognition as if he were the leading man, something unheard of in rock music at the time. As The Who achieved fame and their profile continued to rise exponentially into the 70s, the drummer's behavior became increasingly destructive. Moon had also gained a reputation for his eccentric persona, others would call him Moon the Loon, which most often involved destruction of public property, and he'd also made no secret of his drug abuse. By the time The Who became successful, a man named Peter Dougal Butler would act as Moon's assistant and as a watchful eye to keep the drummer out of trouble. As alluded to earlier, Moon had been well into his amphetamine addiction that he began during the Who's formative years, which continued to put a strain on the band's relationship. He'd even tell the British music newspaper Enemy that his favorite food was an I quote, French blues, the street name for amphetamine. By 1973, The Who toured on their sixth album, Quadrophenia, and the extent of his abuse had made him a liability. In fact, their show at the Cow Palace in Daly, California would go down in infamy. Under the influence of a mix of tranquilizers and brandy, Moon would abruptly faint while playing the song Won't Get Fooled Again. He'd then be taken off stage by a group of roadies who brought him back to consciousness after giving him a quick shower and a shot of cortisone. Following a 30 minute intermission, the roadies wrestled with Moon to get him back on stage and it wouldn't be long before he fainted after playing the song Magic Bus and was probably taken off stage for the remainder of the show. Guitarist Pete Townsend would ask the crowd, can anybody play the drums? I mean, somebody good. And a fan in the audience, a 19 year old drummer, Scott Halpin, went on to complete the band's set. By 1976, Moon's health had further declined and the band was uncertain whether he'd last through the remainder of their tour on their seventh album, The Who by the Numbers. His last public performance with the band would be at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, Canada. A year later, Moon became significantly overweight, which further hampered his ability to play through a private show in London, England's Golden State Cinema which showed a rough cut of their upcoming retrospective documentary, The Kids Are Alright. Once the band wrapped up recording on their eighth and final album with the drummer, Who Are You? Pete Townsend had warned Moon that there wouldn't be an accompanying tour unless he gotten clean. For a while, it seemed like his circumstances would improve as Moon sought to quell his alcoholism and his use of drugs. On September 6, 1978, Moon and his then-girlfriend Annette Walter Lax were invited by Paul and Linda McCartney to, to preview the biopic The Buddy Holly Story in celebration of Buddy Holly's birthday. Moon was working to curb his alcohol withdrawals and was prescribed a powerful sedative by a local physician who wasn't fully informed of the drummer's persistent health issues. The doctor would prescribe him 100 pills and would advise him to take a single pill in each event that a craving occurred, no more than three a day. It was reported that Moon initially didn't want to attend the party, but after his girlfriend said she was going, he changed his mind. But in order to get through the night, Moon would call his dealer to get him drugs. Led Zeppelin's manager Richard Cole, who also attended the premiere, remember talking to Moon that night telling Louder Sound, he said, I feel great, I've given up everything except women, and I'm going to get married again. Moon and his girlfriend would only make it through about an hour of the film before leaving, and Annette would recall, he was restless, he said, I don't want to sit through this, let's go. Back at the couple's flat, Annette and Moon ate some food and went to bed and watched the horror film The Abominable Dr. Fibes. Annette would recall to Moon's biographer Tony Fletcher that the drummer fell asleep around 4 in the morning by, and I quote, taking his usual glass of water and a bucket of pills. Moon, who always seemed to push the limits, was exceeding the recommended dosage of the sedative that was prescribed. 
Annette would claim the drummer woke up around 7.30 complaining about being hungry. And the two would argue for a bit, but Annette would make him some more food. After eating, Annette recalled Moon taking more of the sedative and falling asleep once again. Due to the noise of a snoring, Annette would retreat to the couch in the living room and fall asleep until 3.40 in the afternoon. After Annette woke up, she went to the bedroom to find Moon lying on his stomach and she couldn't hear him breathing. She would recall the louder sound. I couldn't hear him breathing right there and then I knew something was wrong. I went into a panic. She would call the doctor who prescribed the sedative, who in turn called an ambulance, but it was too late. The cause of death was ruled an overdose, and an autopsy revealed that there were 26 undissolved tablets of that sedative in Moon's system. The Who's manager would inform the band of the news. Bassist John Entwistle would be especially devastated upon receiving a call about his friend's death, bursting into tears during an interview when asked about the Who's goals for the future. The following day, Pete Townsend issued a statement, as mentioned in the book Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere, saying, We are more determined than ever to carry on, and we want the spirit of the group to which Keith contributed so much to go on, although no human being can ever take his place. Moon's first successor would be close friend of the Who, Kenny Jones, who would play with the band until 1983 when they called it quits for the time being. The band's current drummer, Zach Starkey, son of Ringo Starr, has remained with the band since 1996, while Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend are the band's lone original members. Bassist John Entwistle would pass away in 2002. In 2009 and 2012, Moon had two plaques made in his honor, one at the Golders Green Crematorium and another at the site of the former Marquee Club. In 2016, Pete Townsend would authorize the book on Keith Moon by Ian Snowball titled A Tribute to Keith Moon. There is no substitute. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll Stories. Take care.